Monday, December 12th, 2022. I'm Jonathan Lau, and this is 5 Minutes of Proof, a weekly analysis of the science behind ozone therapy. As we charge hard towards Christmas here, we're going to take a look again at the World Federation of Ozone Therapies review on evidence-based ozone therapy, starting with Chapter 5, Ozone Ways of Administration. Um, they start with this chart here, or this list, I guess, of different administration avenues for ozone therapy. And the one you choose typically depends on what you're treating. One note that they make before they get into that is just on making sure you're using ozone resistant materials, whether it be tubing, whether it be uh, cannulas um, or, or, or bags or you know anything, syringes that you're using. Um, it's important that we use items that are not going to absorb and disintegrate that pro product, absorb the ozone and disintegrate the product. Um, they, they jump into discussing first, right off the bat, uh, because they want to <laughs> deal with the elephant in the room, DIV, so the direct intravenous route and the DIA, direct intra-arterial route. Um, and they do mention that due to small gas volume and gas fragmentation into the limb capillary bed, intra-arterial or IA administration does not involve the risk of embolism. However, it has been proven that there are not any advantages compared to classic major autohemotherapy or even rectal gas insufflation. That, I would say, has to be qualified because I, I believe when we're talking about, they're talking about humans, but when we're talking about horses or cows, um, I think there are some advantages to doing that route, um, specifically that it becomes much more convenient, and much more doable. Um, they discuss intraperitoneal and intrapleural routes. Um, so intrapleural, I'm not familiar with uh, being done. I guess it's done in Russia. Um, intraperitoneal, however, in the veterinary community is done. It can be very effective. They did some tests to demonstrate that it was not only effective, but safe was their concern in, in some rabbits. So that's something that I think um, we can lean on and appreciate. Um, okay, we're just going to keep going here, talking about wound healing and the phases using ozonated fluids, ozonated saline. There's lots of routes that they kind of basically breeze past, um, but no new information for us that I thought was really relevant um, that we had to touch on. So we'll just keep moving. Um, they, they go into the systemic therapeutic then administration methods, um, and they classify those as major autohemotherapy first, and then minor autohemotherapy, um, and rectal insufflation. So um, let's keep, keep going and take a look here. Again, not a lot. They talk about the, the, the type of um, containers being used for major autohemotherapy. Um, and then they say this, standard accuracy consists in undertaking two or three weekly treatments during 10 to 15 sessions. So I would encourage all of our veterinarians um, to do as many of these treatments as you can, uh, not as many, but uh, within reason, um, two to three is great in a week. Most of the time, not feasible, which is why sometimes having a machine to do rectal insufflation at home can be more beneficial. Um, but 10 to 15 sessions for chronic conditions, for uh, patients where you're not sure what's going on, um, you want to do multiple treatments. So just keep that in mind and, and bear in mind as well that you'll want to evaluate the patient as you go forward. They mentioned how there's really no um, side effects. Some patients, human patients, uh, had some d dizziness. Uh, they said it was probably related to transitory increase in oxygen transported to tissues. Um, but... Uh, that was just a hypothesis. So they talk about minor autohemotherapy, then rectal insufflation. They say the main field of application is re represented by the anal and rectal abscesses with fistula, proctitis, bacterial and ulcerate, ulcerative colitis, Crohn's disease, and chronic viral hepatitis B and C. So those are obviously things that you're going to treat with rectal insufflation, but it goes well beyond there. Then they talk about the gut a bit and how it affects the gut and how they propose it might affect the gut. They say, therefore, rectal insufflation seems to exert a rapid local and systemic effect due to absorption of 
ROS and LOPs generated by ozone interaction with biomolecules. If you don't know what those are, um, go watch the previous one. Present in content of gut lumen. The amount of ROS and LOPs absorbed is, however, unpredictable due to the variable content of lumen, mainly fecal material. So uh, that's true. Uh, fecal material is going to absorb some of that ozone. Um, but we, there have been studies um, that have showed increase in ATP, increase in 2,3-DPG, etc. Um, rectal insufflation should be done after defecating or after an enema when the rectal ampoule is empty. So um, they go into more here about uh, the use of rectal insufflation and what we can expect, that it's safe, that it's, you know, it seems to be uh, having an incredible effect. Um, but then they say uh, this about bactericidal effects. The human colon rectum contains up to 600 grams of, of about 400 different species of anaerobic bacteria. Ozone may partly change the environment for a short while, except in particular conditions like clindamycin-associated Enterocolitis, bacterial activity per se is probably unimportant, but may cause the release of lipopolysaccharides and muramyl peptides. Those aren't words that I use often in my language, so I apologize for stumbling a bit over those. Well, the rectal insufflation with a daily application of oxygen and ozone can re-equilibrate the bacterial flora and lead to normal immune reactivity remains to be demonstrated and explained through empirical results suggest a, though empirical results suggest a beneficial so this has been five minutes of proof thank you for being here we'll see you next time